Welcome to the Soul Touched by Dogs podcast, the show for dog lovers who see dogs not as toys or tools, but wise souls worth our respect and care. I'm Anke Herman, and I'm your host. I talk to wholesome humans, people who do great work for dogs and their people. So come and join us for today's conversation. Hello and welcome to Shali. I'm super happy to have you here. Likewise, thank you for having me. I really look forward to this conversation. Uh, before we dive into the depth of it, um, let people know where are you based and what's your business with dogs? Excellent. Thank you. I am based in India. I work remotely with career-oriented pet parents who are based in US, uh, mainly the Pacific um, time zones and central time zones, as well as Europe. The reason is um, very interesting, although we can look into that once your listeners really want to know and want to connect with me. So there's a reason behind that, but that's what I that's where I am based. And that's what I do. Right. So what's special about pet parents? Like, what do you do for them? Okay. So you know how the older we get, the more we ask, what if? And with pet parents, it's like we have dogs and we love them to bits. And, you know, as they age, we start thinking about what if I spent more time? What if I did things differently so what i do is reawaken harmony to allow such pet parents to bypass the steep cost of regret um, by generating compassion and really spending time with their fur babies oh so you're not missing out on that like oh the steep cost of regret that's juicy that might just turn into the title of this <laughs> so so what but like what would people normally, when they come to you, you know, like what are they looking for? What do they say they want? I mean, are they, I mean, are people, because I'm feeling like, is this something that people are like really aware of and say, hey, I really need help because I don't know, I think I'm not doing the best I can. Or like, what would somebody typically say when they come to you? Great question. So I have two dogs. One is a golden retriever girl. Uh, who, who's because of her energy level, uh, she's uh, mistaken for a male dog. And I have a rehomed rescue adult dog whose name is Marshall. And because he is so quiet and he looks very docile, he's mistaken to be a female. That's funny. <laughs> so I have two dogs and we go out on trips, we go on walks together. So when we are out, uh, the most common um, comments that I get to hear are, oh, she's got two. <laughs> such cute dogs and then pet parents want to know um what breed they are um if they if i've always had them since a puppy the other questions i'm asked once they find out that marshall is uh, adopted he is rehomed they're like oh how did you go into all of this and that's how conversations usually start oh so now and if they say hey we've just adopted a dog can you help or because I'm sort of thinking like the regret is the, the stuff that people become aware afterwards, right? So, you know. Absolutely. Um, so then I just ask them, what is it that they want to know? Because even with dogs, uh, you know, because you've got different breeds, you've got dogs with different ages, different genders, different uh, backgrounds. So you kind of know that it's really, you know, it's a very dynamic combination. Similarly, first I ask them, what is it that they really want? Do they want help with food? Do they just want a, a, somebody to listen to? Because even that's really important. Oh. And then I go from there. Yeah. So for example, uh, they will ask me, what breed is he? And I'm like, I don't know. And I don't really care. However, I do know that he's a Catalan shepherd um, because I did some research. So there's a lot of background investigation, background research that goes into me as a pet parent, I'm a total geek about stuff about my dogs. Um, so when, you know, uh, before getting um, in touch with you, I listened to so many of the guests that you had on board and they talked about food. They talked about the doggy planet. They talked about, you know, um, healing and stuff. So that is really interesting to me. 
and pet parents really come to me with a lot of different questions about even um, so both my dogs are for example um, animal assisted therapy dogs so what on earth does that mean how does that help and then I will tell them that you know just having a dog around you and having humans around who are like no just keep your dogs to yourself and six months down the line when we meet back they'll say oh yeah so and so now interacts with my dog just that much of building a relationship without doing anything else but a wagging tail and those puppy eyes is enough for you know a humans to interact get their stress levels down and the dog really doesn't speak out much but without even uh, speaking out they do so much for the humans and that's a topic that I can go on and on. Oh, about. I love that. I love that. That's so true. I mean, I I got your book. <laughs> no, you sent me your book. I didn't like, I don't want to make it sound as if I went and bought it when you actually sent it to me. I could have bought it. And but the thing that really struck me was how methodical you were when you brought in Marshall. When you brought Marshall home, like that seemed like it's almost like you took this like a research project. That is correct. Yes, absolutely. Because it all began with, you know, I kind of want Blossom to have a companion, uh, a doggy companion, and it doesn't have to be um, someone uh, to mate with, but just a, an animal companion, not just the humans. So that's where my entire research began. So, and I began with volunteering. Um, you know, it's a little, it's, I, I took the, uh, the roundabout route uh, because it ended up being more satisfying, giving me more insights. Um, I mm -hmm. worked, uh, so my educational qualification is uh, in um, a degree in commerce. Uh, we call it the Bachelor of Commerce. So I can be an accountant. I can work as an accountant. So I went to a veterinarian here and I said, hey, do you want somebody in accounting and operations? And he was happy to take me on. So I worked in a veterinary clinic. So I found out what doctors do, what pet parents come to them with and um, or, you know, I work so different aspects. That, that's why I'm saying I'm taking the roundabout route to becoming a pet parent. So I researched about rescues, about shelters, about and this whole world about uh, dogs who uh, need to be rehomed came up. And I'm like, OK, so Blossom's companion is going to be rehomed. I don't want a golden retriever. I want a different breed. I don't care what breed it is as long as uh, they can be, you know, kind of trained to be, you know, not make a mess in the house and not bark unnecessarily. Otherwise, the, the house is ruled by the dogs. They are leash free. They are cage free, but with a bit of discipline. So I went about doing a lot of research and then finally Marshall came home. He's I call him my secret Santa because he came on 24th of December. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> Absolutely. And the first, uh, you know, just the first week, I could see he would find a cozy corner in the room that most of us were in and he would just sit there and I could feel off him that I like being a part of a family unit is the feeling I got from him. And that was just so humbling to know that that was something as simple as that was his ask. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, you've got a home and let's just work out all the things together. So yeah, I'm a bit methodical. <laughs> but that's beautiful because I think it's almost like the opposite of what most people do. You know, they just bring a dog home and they just like expect the dog to magically know how everything works. And what I love about the way you even unpack that in the book, it's like, you know, it kind of shows why it can actually be challenging because there are a lot of little things to think about and a lot of, steps that one could kind of overlook right so if you compare how you went about you know making sure Marshall fits into the family and what you see say your clients or other people do what's the biggest mistake people make like what's the what's the what's the step that most people uh, or too many people overlook Okay, so I'm smiling as you complete the <laughs> sentence because I'm so excited to share. <laughs> Excuse me for that. Um, what I see is, you know, how you have those Instagram or social media memes where um, one picture is when you have a meeting in audio 
uh, it's a whole messy face. And when you have an online meeting on video, it's a well-made up face. <laughs> That's basically the reality. <laughs> when you get a dog home, we want to go all in and we are correct in our place. It's just that as a dog, they and they want to be a part of the family the way they want to be a part of the family the, the only way they know how is to jump is to bark and uh, is to chew because that's the senses that they are attuned to the most and this gap becomes uh, too big it keeps getting bigger Unless we sit down, give them space, we take our space and take it one day at a time and not have them into a well-trained, um, a well-behaving uh, person from day zero. Yes, training starts from day zero. Yes, good manners start from day zero, not even day one. I don't even wait. The second he got into my vehicle was when uh, his good manners, you know, instructions began. I don't like to call it training because I I say the dogs trained me to become a better human, not the other I way around. I think so too. Yeah, totally. That totally speaks to me too. <laughs> Absolutely. So that is basically it. So give them space, give them time, give them a lot of love. And also remember to be disciplined in what you do with them. And you'll just have a really beautiful relationship. Mm. So when you say be disciplined in what you do with them, what does that look like? Because, you know, discipline is a, is a, I think in the dog training world can be a bit of a loaded word, you know, because it's, it's about being clear of how we do things around here, you know, so how, how do you go about that? How do you go about teaching your dog like, okay, you know, the sofa is off limits or not, or like, I don't want you to pee in the house or chew up whatever. Excellent. Yes, you're, and, I, and you're absolutely right. There are different perspectives to discipline. Um, and even with uh, my two dogs, their discipline angles are totally different. Um, but then I take into consideration the breed of the dog. So, you know, they're just naturally um, a shepherd or a sheep dog could be an alerting dog. So his first instinct could be to bark and could be to round up. So you can't not take that into consideration. The second thing was that I did experiment with a long leash um, enclosures. So he, the, uh, my leashes for both of them are they begin with 500 meters. So it's like half a foot, one foot and two feet long leashes that I have. I don't have shorter leashes than that. They're always on a harness and not on a collar. It's just something that I've realized that they like it. So I would experiment gently that if, is he, is he food oriented? Then I found out that no, he really spooks and food doesn't help. Comfort helps. He needs a, he needs a cozy, um, unlit place and that's where mm. he's the most comfortable he likes being anchored and how will I anchor him I've got a long leash but it's tethered to his spot and he can roam around but to a certain extent and that's to me what discipline means is that uh, they have some non-negotiables so when it's the afternoon or when it's late in the night even if there is a disturbance they will bark as an alert and not go into a barking frenzy the reason, the main reason being I live in the uh, heart of the city here. It's a very urban setting and there are a lot of senior citizens around me and it really messes up, you know, uh, their night schedule if dogs are barking continuously and they've understood that. And, you know, so that's uh, one of the non-negotiables I have. The other non-negotiable is that you can't chew on a human being. <laughs> You've got your toys. <laughs> And they've got a lot of frozen treats. Everything other than that is up for negotiation. Oh, I love that. I love that. Because I think it's all driven. It's driven by love. It's, it's to keep them safe. It's to keep... And you know what I really love about what you just shared? Is how you really listen to the dog in front of you. You know, so it's not just like, here are the rules. It's like, okay, what does this dog need? What does this dog need? And I think 
we can do a lot of good for our dogs if we just follow that one rule. So like literally listen to the dog in front of you and experiment, right? To try stuff out, to see what works, what works best. I I just totally love that. And, you know, I really wish, I mean, I, I want to ask you, where can people get the, get your book and, um, you know, find out more about you, connect with you? What are you going to say? Definitely. And thank you for saying <laughs> It is, and it and it feels like a struggle initially. So, uh, think about it like getting to know a new friend. Uh, when we go to school, uh, as children or as adults, young adults, the the college environment, the high school environment is new for us as a person. So we want to experiment. We want to see who the cool kids are, who you know the quiet ones are, who really want to be friends. And it takes time for us to make friends, uh, be acquainted with other students. Uh, so, you know, if we look at that perspective and just take the whole chunk of that and move it to dog parenting, um, it'll make our lives more stress free, I would say, you know, give yourself some grace that every dog is different and you want to do what's best for them. So uh, just go about it a little kindly. I love that. I love that. So where can people get the book and, you know, connect with you? Um, so definitely, um, just for your guests uh, and your listeners, I do have a special um, offer, which you will put in the notes. So I'm not going to say it out loud, but where they can get the book is on um, two uh, online sites, which is K-O-B-O Kobo and on Google Books. And if they go to my website, uh, which is Rushali, okay, it's a very unique name and I believe your uh, listeners will remember it so I'm going to say it a little slowly <laughs> it's uh, Vrushali and Blossom dot com because uh, we'll Vrushali is my above. name and Blossom is my dog's name and we work together as a team that's why oh. it has to be me and my dog so it's Vrushali I love that <laughs> And like, and, and so now I'm thinking like the more dogs you get, then it's going to get longer and longer. <laughs> Absolutely. And if they put in forward slash adopt hyphen don't hyphen shop, so adopt don't shop, dashes in between, that's where they can get my e -books. I love that. I love that. Well, thank you so much. And because I think there's so much... Um, like practical tips but also I, love, I just love the attitude you bring to this so like thank you so much this was absolutely delightful and I can't wait to connect with you again thank you for having me bye bye thanks so much for listening if you enjoyed the episode don't forget to subscribe and leave a review so other dog lovers can find the show if you haven't already, head over to soultouchedbydogs.com and sign up for weekly doggy cuteness, tips, recommendations and personal stories to warm your dog-loving heart. And if you know a awesome human you think I should interview, I'd love an introduction. Email me at anke, that's A-N-K-E, at soultouchedbydogs.com.